is brought to you by Head Start Basketball. You got to know what you do really well. And if you're confident and aware enough to do that, you're my kind of guy. David Sloan is the men's basketball associate head coach at Carnegie Mellon University, where he also serves as the Titans recruiting coordinator. Sloan came to Carnegie Mellon from Maine Maritime Academy, where he served as the top men's assistant coach for two seasons and was the head recruiter. Prior to coaching the Mariners, he served as an assistant coach at Boyertown Area High School in Boyerton, Pennsylvania. In addition, Sloan has coached at numerous camps, including the Tom Izzo Basketball Camp at Michigan State University, as well as being an instructor at the prestigious Hoop Group. Sloan is a 2014 graduate of Alvernia University with a Bachelor of Science degree in athletic training. While at Alvernia, he was a four-year player for the Wolves basketball team. Hey, Hoopheads, transform your training this May with our partners and friends at Dr. Dish Basketball. Their Dr. Dish shooting machines are undoubtedly the most advanced and user-friendly machines on the market. Get $3,000 off any commercial machine in the month of May. Learn more at drdishbasketball.com and follow their incredible content at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Mention the Hoopheads podcast and save an extra $300 on the Dr. Dish Rebel, All-Star, and CT models. Visit drdishbasketball.com for details. That's a great deal, Hoopheads. Get your Dr. Dish shooting machine today. Hi, this is Don Showalter from USA Basketball, and you are listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast. Prepare like the pros with the all-new Fast Draw and Fast Scout. Fast Draw has been the number one play diagramming software for coaches for years. You'll quickly see why Fast Model Sports has the most compelling and intuitive basketball software out there. For a limited time, Fast Model is offering Hoop Heads listeners 15% off Fast Draw and Fast Scout. Just use the code HHP15 at checkout to grab your discount and you'll be on your way to more efficient game prep and improved communication with your team. Fast Model also has new coaching content every week on its blog, plus play and drill diagrams on its play bank. Check out the links in the show notes for more. Fast Model Sports is the best in basketball. Get ready to take some notes as you listen to this episode with David Sloan, men's basketball associate head coach at Carnegie Mellon University. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here with my co-host Jason Sunkel tonight. And we are pleased to welcome David Sloan, associate men's basketball head coach at Carnegie Mellon University. David, welcome to the Hoop Heads Pod. I appreciate you having me on. Thrilled to have you on. Looking forward to diving into all the things that you've been able to do in your basketball career thus far. Let's start by going back in time to when you were a kid. Tell us a little bit about some of your first experiences with the game, what you remember from an early age. Yeah, well, uh, like a lot of people, you know, I was one of those guys that just kind of had a ball in my hand from pretty much from the moment I could walk. And so, um, you know, I, I grew up playing a million different sports. Um, I mean, it was, I was in season pretty much all year long. Uh, and so, you know, unlike some other people, I mean, I, I didn't really grow up in a super kind of sports oriented family. Um, now my, my mother played division three, uh, basketball. So that's kind of where I got, uh, my love for the game, but, um, I, I just, I did everything, you know, and, and gr- going through high school, I was playing five sports, uh, through high school. And so it was just a, a constant, you know, a constant in season, a constant competition, and and it's really something that I just continue to 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 seek out. Um, and and like I'm sure a lot of people that end up in the game of basketball, something just always drew me back. And, and so, you know, no matter what season I was in, it was getting home and getting a ball in my hands, or or watching a game, or you know, trying to find some way to kind of tie everything back into basketball because that's it's just what I I kind of fell in love with. Explain to me how you play five sports in high school. <laughs> well, I did. Uh, I, I had a fall sport, a winter sport, a spring sport um, while playing my. So I, I played soccer, uh, I played basketball, and I played volleyball. Um, while in the spring, I also played baseball in the in the local you know town league, um, and then I also played a, a uh, did a fifth sport um, on my own, kind of all year round, um, and, and that was competitive riflery. And so I. 
I uh, did that, and that was completely on my own. It wasn't a, a school sport, um, but I did that kind of all year round. All right, so I got two things. Riflery, where does that come from? Well, I I grew up in central Pennsylvania, um, and so, you know, my family was big in, in hunting and, and that kind of stuff, and so um, just kind of always been around it, and then my older brother got involved, and I kind of followed suit. Um, and, and so it was, it was a lot of fun. Definitely took me some places I never thought I'd be. <laughs> All right. What about the volleyball? I, this is one of the things that I find to be sort of interesting when it comes to the relationship between guys who play volleyball. And I don't know a ton of volleyball slash basketball players, but I mm-hmm. do know there are several that I've known in my life. And we've had, I think one or two, maybe on the podcast that have talked about how just the training for volleyball and what it does to your ability to improve your vertical jump and just yep. sort of the correlation between the two sports. How do you feel like that volleyball experience impacted you as a basketball player? Well, I think there's there's a natural progression kind of between the two, especially with footwork. Um, you know, your, your footwork and, you know, having to get behind the ball, having to pass, your approaches for, for spikes, you know, all of that, it was such um, – it, it was just so detailed. And so naturally that kind of, I, I think that crosses over really easily. Um, but for me, you know, I started as an outside hitter until they figured out I couldn't jump. So they moved <laughs> me to a setter pretty quick. And, uh, but I think that for me, I loved it. Uh, the decision making, you know, the, the trying to feed people, understanding which hitters, you know, hadn't touched, touched the ball, needed to get going, where they needed it to be, um, what they liked, and then the strategy of, you know, on the court trying to, you know, mess up the defense and, and beat blocks. And, I mean, it, it really was – it's just like a point guard, right, trying to run a team in, in basketball. And so, uh, for me, I, I loved it. Uh, it was a great sport. I had a lot of fun. But I think there's a lot of carryover both, you know, footwork and technique but also in the in the strategy of the game yeah it's interesting it's not really necessarily what again i don't claim to be any type of volleyball expert i was going to say yeah i just try to whack the ball back over the net so you're saying (laughs) are you saying there's a little bit more to it than that is that what you're trying to get at here you know just a little bit i I, i'm not sure i even went very deep but uh (laughs) there is a little all right, that's good. That's I swear, good I swear that's Ben good Stiller once said it's just a game, but I don't know right. if he said that in, in the, well, that was Meet the Parents, right? That was Meet the Parents, yeah, Mike? I, that, sounds that sounds right. That sounds you, right. Have you seen that, that movie, right Mike? I know it might be a little foggy for you. I don't know. I believe I've, I believe seen, I've seen it. it. That, that came out a long time ago, so there's a good chance. Like 2003, 2004, Mike. There you go. I think there's a good chance. Mike has a blind spot. It came out before my kids. Mike has a blind spot, David. Mike's blind spot for movies is anything once the kids were born, he doesn't know anything. Yeah, pop well, culture good. references pre two thousand and four. I'm good. I got you covered. I can well, name stuff off. That's when the movies no have to start getting censored. So I, that's, I can, that's true too. I can believe that. That is that is definitely true. All right. So when you think about your time as a high school athlete, and obviously you're involved in all these different sports, you're getting exposed to lots of different coaches. Do you have a particular coach? And maybe it's not even a basketball coach, but do you have a particular coach that sort of stands out to you that somehow had an influence on you later in life that caused you to think maybe you wanted to go into coaching. Is there something or somebody that sort of fits that bill for you? I I wouldn't say in particular because I was lucky enough. I had a lot of people. And and so, you know, definitely um, I had a lot of coaches that I could take little things from, whether it be in preparation, whether it be what it takes to be successful, um, you know, discipline uh, or (laughs) as simple. I mean, our, my volleyball coach, you just were scared of her. And so understanding, you know, I better right. do what I need to do uh, and, and stay stay out of trouble. And so um, I, I, I was lucky enough, you know, and, and I think that's part of the benefit of me doing so much and being involved in so much. I just had a lot of people in my life that that helped. And, and I didn't need that, you know, the, that one or two coach to do everything for me. Um, I had enough people in, in that village, if you will, that I could take those those bits and pieces from everybody I was interacting with and kind of that helped shape me as an athlete. Um, so I had a lot of experience to bring in, you know, when I did decide to get into coaching. Yeah, absolutely. Especially when you think about the different perspectives coming from different sports. And then obviously, I'm sure in all the different sports, you had a different role. And I think that's always beneficial when you start talking about being able to relate to players and kind of where they are in the totem pole 
of your team. I think the more sports that you play, I think that's one of the things that as a multi-sport athlete that serves you really well is just your ability to understand sort of different roles. And then as a coach, I think you can relate to players. When you think about your time as a high school basketball player, do you have a memory that stands out to you when you think back to your high school years as a basketball player? Is there one thing that pops out at you that, man, that's what high school basketball was all about for me? Yeah, I was in a pretty unique uh, position, especially for basketball, that I had a different varsity coach every year of my high school career. And we we went through a ton, um, it, it just a lot of different circumstances. And, and by senior year, you know, being in a very small, I mean, I went to a public school that graduated 166 kids. And so, you know, being in a very small school, it, it's the same as a lot of small town USA, right? The, the same kind of group of, of kids play, you know, play every, every sport. And so, um, we had a really good senior class, um, had, a, you know, my senior year was the best year in every sport that we had, um, that, that we experienced in our four years. And so, you know, going into my, my senior year for basketball, uh, we actually had the winningest head coach in high school history come out of retirement, uh, just for our senior season. And, and he, you know, again, we kind of had that, that turnover coaching wise. And, and he said, Hey, I'll come back for one year. Give yourself time to find another coach for after, but this is a special group and and we want to win. And, and so he came back and man, it, it was funny, you know. It just a, a blast from the past with some of those uh, OG, you know, uh, um, habits and and superstitions, if you will. Like the best one, I, I still laugh to this day. Uh, everybody had to have a Dixie cup of Coca Cola at halftime, and his belief was you needed just a jolt of caffeine to come out of halftime. And I was like, Coach, you you know there's science that says this isn't right. And he goes, You see how many games we won? I said, Yep. And I grabbed my Dixie Cup every game, and so it uh, it worked. I mean, we we got back to the state tournament for the first time in in a while, and so you know that for me, just kind of going through the turnover, going through different styles, going through ups and downs, but. You know, having a, one, having a coach that wanted to come out of retirement because he he saw something in our squad um, and, and then be able to reach that. Um, that that just was a it, it's a memory I'll never forget. That's a great story with the Coke. It's funny how coaches kind of get things in their head and they just sort of do it. And that's the way it is. And hey, so when, I don't care. I don't, I don't really win, care if there's hard science to go away that. from it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's funny because when I, like when I was playing at Kent, I was there from 88 to 92 and we used to have steak before every meal. And I probably never told my coach just because you talked about being afraid of your coach. Well, that was me. And uh, that was all of us on the team back then. But I never would have said, hey, coach, I think there might be some science that says we probably – steak might not be the best thing to eat <laughs> pregame. But I could eat pretty much anything except for pizza, so I didn't care. I'm like, hey, we're having steak again? Cool. I mean, <laughs> yeah. count, 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 count me in. But Yeah, yeah never, just- never argue when they offer steak. Nah, that's for sure. Yeah, I'm like, I, I'll, I think I'll take that. I'll take the steak. So, yeah, it's funny just how coaches kind of get in there uh, to get something going that's that's worked. And hey, science be damned. Let's move on and just do what we do what we do and, and keep winning games. Did you always have in mind that uh, you wanted to play college basketball? Obviously, as you're playing all these different sports, you said that basketball kind of was the one that you kept gravitating back to. But did you have in your mind as a high school player that you wanted to go and try to play college basketball? I, I did. Um, I it, I would. <laughs> I'm not ashamed to admit it was not my best sport, uh, but it was always the sport that I wanted to move forward with. And so um, always, you know, kind of going through the process, I I didn't know what it took. (laughs) You know, it's kind of that pipe dream, but you never really know what you got to do. But it it was always the sport I wanted to move forward with going into college. I I always wanted to be a college athlete um, and and just kind of going through the years, it just always came back to basketball. What was the recruiting process like for you? How'd you make your decision? Yeah, so I, I, I wasn't really recruited uh, a, a whole lot. Um, you know, I, I kind of made made a decision early that I knew I wanted to play, um, but I, for me, I, I knew I needed to make an academic decision first. And so I, I kind of limited, you know, I, I was pretty intentional with my, with my college uh, search. I, I looked at four different schools, you know, that kind of get got to the end for a visit came down to four different schools. Two of them uh, were for sport management and two of them were for athletic training. And, and, you know, I figured, let me take a look. And as I figure out what I want to study, um, you know, on the visits, I, I met with the coaches and kind of the, the normal walk on, 
you know, tight path. And, uh, uh, and for me, and I, I tell this story every, every year with recruits, uh, because I, I did my third visit and I was ready. I said, said to my mother, I'm here, let's send the money in. I'm good. And, you know, I <clears throat> kind of rolled my eyes at her a little bit and she said, no, let's just do our last, you know, our last visit. And I said, all right, why? Right. I'm, I'm set. Here's where I'm going. And no, let's do the last visit. And, and so I, I did my last visit and it was no lie about a half hour into the campus tour of my last visit. And I said, thank God I didn't send my money in. I'm coming here. Uh, and that's, and that was at Alvernia university, which is where I uh, ended up. And, and so the recruitment, you know, I met with coach Miller kind of during, during my visit. And as I was looking to the school and, you know, I got an opportunity, he kind of said, Hey, if you, if you want to be a part of the team, you know, we got a spot for you. Um, can't promise you anything, but you know, there's, there's a spot if you want it. So I got lucky that I, I found a, found a school that I really could as a walk on, I, I really could find the academics I wanted, but join a, a really successful basketball program too. So at that point you're thinking athletic training. Yep. So that's, um, when I made the decision for, for Alvernia, it was, uh, for, for a bachelor's in athletic training. At what point during your college experience do you start thinking about coaching? Well, my, my decision to coach actually started when I was about 10 years old. Okay. So <laughs> there's, there's a, a, a funny story from Little League Baseball, and I, I, I won't, uh, won't bore you with the, the entirety of it, but pretty much my coach didn't call a sign that I thought he should have called. So I called timeout as the 10-year-old <laughs> coaching first base, and I walked over to him and I said, you forgot to do this. And he told me to get the hell back to first base, and I wasn't allowed coaching again. So it, it was pretty clear early on that uh, – you know, I, I kind of had that that eye toward strategy and, and really kind of took the coaching path even kind of before I realized it. But but I always thought that way. Um, and so I actually when I was looking at schools, you know, I, I always wanted to coach. Um, really, I was finding what my backup plan would be. And so I, I you know, obviously knew I had to go go to college and, and wanted to play. And so it was kind of, hey, if coaching doesn't work out, what do I want to do? And, and that's how I kind of fell upon athletic training and, and really loved it. But it was always kind of a plan B. All right. So after graduation, you continue on at Alvernia as a grad assistant mm -hmm. in the athletic training field, correct? Yep. All right. And so you get your master's in business administration. At that point, are you still thinking athletic training? Are you looking at, hey, what are going to be my opportunities once I have this master's? It's going to open up some more opportunities on the coaching front. Just where was your mindset at, at that point? Yeah, my, my senior year, I was I, I was starting to look at um, some grad programs. You know, I, I always wanted to do a grad school right away. Um, I, I, I'm definitely somebody that I, if I stopped school, I probably wasn't going to go back. And so I, I wanted to get it out of the way, um, you know, right away. And so I looked at a couple positions for coaching um, and then obviously a couple AT, just honestly finding a way to get my grad school paid for. And I was lucky enough, um, you know, my, my program director – you know, had, had approached me and, and offered me the spot to stay at Alvernia um, early on. And, and it was kind of a, you know, hey, this the spot's yours if you want it, but we got to know now. And, and this was before, you know, uh, anybody was hiring for GAs with coaching. And, you know, this is January. Um, and so as I as I thought about it, I, I kind of said to myself, hey, I, I got to take my master's and, and I, I got to take the opportunity that's that's here. You know, I always wanted to coach, but I can wait two more years. And, and so um, I, I took that, but I was lucky enough to, at the same time, to be able to join into a high school staff. So I, I was able to start my coaching career at the high school level um, while I was a GA athletic trainer too. All right. So as you're thinking about where you want to go with coaching and you coach at the high school level, I think there's clearly some guys that get to high school, they're like, oh, I love this high school piece of it. And some guys have gone to school for education and <clears throat> teaching. And then there are other guys who get into college and they're like, man, the college space where I'm able to focus on basketball, at least theoretically, right? You're focusing on basketball all day as opposed to somebody having to teach in a classroom. So what did you like about your experience as a high school coach? And then to go along with that, was there any thought that maybe that would be the spot that you would stay trying to be a high school coach? Yeah, I – 
I love my two years. I, I had a great, um, you know, I joined a great staff and, and I kind of got lucky. I, I was working at camp uh, at Alvernia and uh, the, the varsity coach for, for Boyertown, Mike Ludwig, he, he was running the camp and, you know, we were just kind of talking and, you know, he was talking about how all of his assistant coaches had all played at, you know, at that high school. Like everybody was kind of in that program and, and he, he wanted an outside point of view. And I was kind of like, well, I'm also looking for a coaching job. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think you have a spot? And, and so I, I got lucky. I, I joined on. I was an assistant for both JV and varsity and, um, you know, did a lot of started to do a lot of film breakdown and, and scouting and some of that as, as, as well as the player development. And so really kind of dove in and he, and he was awesome. Um, really, you know, accepting the new ideas and bringing this outsider in and, um, you know, right out of school and, and it worked really well, but I, I'll tell you the, the whirlwind that I dealt with those two years that solidified that I wanted to get back to college. And we went from my first year running, the Wisconsin swing offense with two six eight guys, uh, and our leading scorer ended up being our freshman six one shooter because they'd throw it inside, everybody would double triple team them, kick it out, and it hit a couple threes. Right to my second year, our tallest player was our now six three sophomore shooting guard, and we went to a five out offense. And I was like, "Oh dear Lord, I need to be able to recruit." Like, yeah, I mean, I, I just. <laughs> It's like it was great. It worked. I love the guys. I, I love the program. But I, to me, it was you know a, a big piece was the recruiting, right? I, I want to play a consistent style, you know, and and I'll obviously be able to tailor to to player strengths. But like I, I wanted to get to something that I could build rather than hey, what am I going to get next year, right? That that kind of you know I don't have a say in it, right? A, of a public school, and so that that was a lot of it. Um, and then the other thing was just. You know, my four years in college as a person was so impactful in, in terms of the growth that I went through that I always wanted to get back to that college environment um, because I just think it's such an impactful, you know, four years of, of somebody's life that I I grew a lot. I had a lot of fun. Um, and, and so I want to try and, you know, I always wanted to get back to that environment to be able to give that experience to, to somebody else. Yeah, it's very cool. I think that no matter whether you're talking about high school or you're talking about college, whatever experience that you have, I think there's a lot of guys that feel exactly the same way you do, David, in that, hey, this was a time that was really, really impactful on me. It could also be that maybe for people who played both high school and college basketball, sometimes one experience or the other was maybe better or more impactful on that yep. person. And sometimes that's what draws people in, right? Is like, hey, my high school experience was so good that I want a kid to be able to have that same experience. I want to be able to give that to them. And conversely, like in your case, talking about the college experiences where you really felt like that was where there was a, maybe a greater impact. And so, yeah. I can completely understand where you're coming from. And as you started to look at that, I think, you know, you're in the high school for two years while you're getting your master's degree and you're getting that coaching experience and you're getting a feel for – what it's like to be on the floor. As you said, I'm sure you got to do a lot of different things with the film breakdown and being able to do player development, just get involved. Was there one particular aspect of what you did at the high school level from a coaching standpoint that you took to right away that you were like, oh man, I love this. I know that whatever coaching job I end up getting in the future throughout my entire career, this is going to be one part of it that I'm always going to love. For me, it's the strategy. And and that's, you know, this thinking strategically it can be scheme it can be development you know but it's it's kind of that that macro level you know how, how can we move these pieces right that's that's something that's just always fascinated me um so watching film and and trying to figure out you know schematics of what of what we can do different how we can attack somebody how we can improve you know whatever that case might be or or player development wise like hey let's put a plan together we want to get to you know this how are we going to get there? And and so I I was lucky enough that I, I could do a lot of that, and mostly because you know of my traveling back and forth, I, I did a lot of film work just on campus before I got over to practice, and um, and that's I, I really kind of fell in love with that. Just the the way to look at it, the way to kind of combine how can you take strengths, hide weaknesses, um, combine you know five guys into into doing whatever it is that you want to do. Um, I, I just I've always loved that about any sport. Um, but really, as I got into coaching, that's something that I, I just, to this day, I, I just love 
love thinking about, love talking about, and love doing. How do you grow in that area? What are your methods for going out and trying to learn more and break down and figuring out more of the X's and O's and the strategy piece? Is it mostly going film with the level that you're coaching at? Are you watching your own team? Are you watching other teams? Are you watching other college teams? Are you watching NBA? Some combination of both? Is it going to mentors? Just how do you improve yourself from an X's and O's strategy standpoint? Obviously, it's something that you're passionate about. So, where do you go to learn more? Everywhere. I, I mean, I think that, like, <laughs> you, you know, I, I laugh that ever since I became a coach, I'm not sure I can ever watch a sporting event for pure enjoyment ever again. You know, I watch an NBA game and and you're always like, okay, what they just run there? Oh, that worked. Hold on, let me write that down. You know, you're you're just always in that coach thought process. And so, you know, for me, it's yeah, it's it's watching, you know, watching teams that are successful, watching teams that do, you know, similar things to to what we do or or what I believe, you know, and want to do. Um, I think you also got to be intentional with watching teams that don't, you know, do things the way you do them or or want to do them. Just to make sure you're you're seeing a different option, right? Hey, I, I don't want to run this offense, but they're good, right? What can I take from it? How how can I make that fit? Um, but then I, I think when you look when you look at the broad picture and, and something we talk about, you know, with our guys all, all the time, I'm constantly talking about it. Is you just got to be intentional. And so you know, ask talking to mentors. Um, I mean, I, obviously the the longer you're in, you're in coaching, the more friends you got in coaching. Just calling them up and being like, hey, when you scout, like what what do you look for? Right? Or or hey, you're putting your offensive game plan together. What do you, you know, are you looking at individual matchups? Are you looking at more of the team? Like just picking people's brains. Um, and, and it could be, you know, a five-minute conversation, it could be an hour-long conversation. And just trying to find ways and and tap into the knowledge that everybody else has, right? And then and then find ways that kind of sticks with you, sticks with your program and um how you can fit that into what you're already doing. Uh, and so for me, it's just, it's, it's trying to learn in every which way. Um, you know, I talk to our other sports coaches. I, I talk to friends that, you know, one, one of my best friends is in sales. I talk to them all the time about that, right? Because recruiting has a lot to do with sales. And so, you know, as, so it's not even about coaching or, or recruiting, but talking about relationship building, talking about, you know, presentation, just, so it, it, there's, there's a million different ways that you can learn um, and, and places you can take things from. For me, it's just about being intentional and seeking those out. And, and if you're willing to, to ask the questions and do the work, um, then I think you got a lot of knowledge at your fingertips. As you gather that knowledge. So one of the things that as somebody who's early in your career and you've been an assistant coach, you're probably in a position where at some point you're going to have an interest in becoming a head coach. So you're gathering all this knowledge at the different places that you've been, the different coaches that you've played for, the different coaches that you've worked with, mentors that you're reaching out to, film that you're studying, all these different things. How do you compile all that stuff into some type of format that you can actually access that you can go back to? Because we all love finding right that new thing. <laughs> you're like, hey, man, this is awesome. We're going to try this or, hey, let's do that. But two weeks later, oh, where'd that go? So what's your system for sort of keeping that stuff together and starting to get a plan together for, hey, this is when I eventually get an opportunity. Here's what I want my program to look like. Here's what I want my offensive and defensive philosophies to look like. How do you put all that together so that it stays organized? Well, I'm all ears if you have a good plan. <laughs> I don't. Uh, I'll be the first to tell you. I probably, <laughs> probably don't have that part ironed out. Uh, <laughs> But to me, I was lucky enough that, that when I when I got into coaching, you know, my, my first the, the varsity coach I worked for and, and then every every boss that I've had at the college level, every single one of them ha has talked to me from the very beginning on, hey, if you want to do this, you got to prepare to be a head coach from day one. A and you got to think that way. You, you've got to compile things that way. You got to start building, you know, that portfolio and, and you know, build your booklet and, and do all of that from day one. And so for me, it's, you know, I, I have probably way too many computer files. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a hoarder, hoarder in that sense. Um, so, you know, keeping track of articles, keeping track of, of different things, um, you know, that, that, we, uh, that we find that works. I, I just try and, I try and file that away. Um, you know, I, like I'm sure a lot of, uh, a lot of people, you know, I, I have a Google Sheets that literally is what I will do. 
and and it's just an idea bank of you know things that I've seen, things that we've done, um, ideas I've had of hey, if I if I get if I'm lucky enough to get that shot to be a head coach, this is something I'm going to do in the program, right? I I got to find a way to get this fit in, and so you know really it's it's just about uh, about trying to take as as many notes as possible, um, and then hope that what you're doing and how you're compiling is in somewhat organized. Uh, so whenever you need to get back to it, you can find it. Um, but it, it, to me, it's, I also think it's, it's, if you, if you like an idea enough, you're going to remember it. Right. And, and so it's this idea of, Hey, I, I want to look at it. I, I want to think about it. You know, a couple days here, I, I, I got a sticky note, you know, on my computer, I'm looking at it and I'm thinking about it. If after a couple days, I don't think about that anymore, then it's probably not going to be a sustainable idea, right? If it's something that I can go back to and, and hey, I, I really need to find a way to do this or, or this idea just pops up every year. Hey, can we do this? Nope, not this year. All right, I'll, I'll bring it up next year, right? That idea, if the longer it stays with you, then I think the, the more it's kind of ingrained and, and reinforces that it's something that you really believe in, care about, and want to make sure you do. So you got a system. It's a sticky note system. Oh, there's a lot of sticky notes. I'll tell you that. <laughs> All right. So you get your master's and you've had two years of experience at the high school level. You kind of feel like, hey, college is the place where I'm going to be. Tell us a little bit about that first initial job search. Who do you talk to? Where are you sending letters to, emails? Who are you calling? Just what was that process like for you to be able to get that first job? Well, I, I'll be honest, I got really lucky. Uh, uh, an assistant coach I played for um, in college, uh, he called me up and, and uh, this would have been, so spring break, or just before spring break of, of the last year, my master's, um, and, and he called me up and said, hey, you know, a, a friend of mine uh, in Maine is looking for an assistant, you know, for, for next year, um, are you interested? And at that point, I'm like, I, I'm still finishing my degree. Like, I, I haven't really even got to the point of like job searching or thinking about it. I'm, I'm traveling to Florida with our baseball team, getting, getting ready for like 10 games in six days as an athletic trainer. Right. <laughs> and, and, and he said, you know, I, I can connect you if you're interested. And I, I'm not sure I even like hesitated. I was just like, yes. And he goes, do you want to know the school? And I'm like, I, I, I just, yes. Like, I want to talk to him. I'm interested. Let's, let's see what happens. Right. And, and so I, I had my, my first interview, um, while in Florida between double headers, we had about an hour and a half between the end of the first game and, and warmups for the second. And I, I split off and, and hop on a call. And, um, and so I have my, my phone interview there. Um, and, and you know, was lucky enough, kind of got invited up to campus. And, and so a little later that spring, I drove myself, you know, drove, my dad went with me. We drove from Pennsylvania up to Maine, um, got a look at campus, met with uh, the head coach uh, up there. And, and so I, I just kind of, I got lucky. And so the, the, the horrors of job searching and all that trying to break in, you know, I, I didn't experience that. Um, I, I kind of got lucky and it, it kind of fell into my lap because of connections that, you know, I had and, and then kind of the secondary connections from there. Um, and so it, uh, yeah, I'd only ever been to Maine once in my life. And that was when I was a little kid on vacation. And next thing you know, I'm moving up there to a, a coastal town of 700 people. So well, you, was, were probably uh, ahead of, you were probably ahead of most people by being there once, I would guess. Y yes, uh, <laughs> I, I at least had an idea uh, of Maine, and and so it was. Uh, yeah, it just it's kind of funny how it all came together. All right, tell us a little bit about the school, Maine Maritime Academy. What's that school like, and what was the experience like there? Well, it's it's a school that definitely not many people know of. Um, but and I mean, I never knew of it uh, until you know I, I interviewed and. As I got there and, and really learned about, you know, the niche being a maritime school, um, it, it's, it's an incredible education, um, a very specific education. But if that's what you want to do, boy, it sets you up really well. And so it's a, it, you know, I wouldn't call it a high academic, but it is a higher academic um, institution. Very good uh, alumni, you know, job outcomes, um, very, 
very, very specific. And everybody thinks of it as a, a military institution, right? You know, there's, there's people walking around in the uniform and all that, but, it, but it's not. It's, it's the state version of Merchant Marine Academy. And, and so, you know, you, we had guys, we had a lot of business guys, and it was a logistics degree. So a very important, very specific, very high demand degree um, that didn't have any of that, you know, quote unquote, military type feel to it. And so um, it was kind of a, a undiscovered gem. Um, but uh, I will tell you, I, I can tell when I got there why it was a little bit undiscovered. Uh, it's in a town of 700 people. Um, it is on the coast uh, in a, a, the town, Castine, Maine, is, is a little peninsula. So like you stand where my house was, you could stand and see about 180 degrees of ocean. It was awesome. I mean, I, I loved it. Um, and so it's a, it was a cool place to be as a guy who greatly enjoys the outdoors. Um, it, it was an awesome place to get to, had a blast being up there, um, but definitely one that everybody I talked to, I swear in the recruiting process, it took me like a month to convince kids that uh, we were in fact a school uh, and we were in fact in the United <laughs> States. Um, and, and once we got past that hurdle, then we were off and running and we were golden. So what's that recruiting process look like? Because obviously there is a pretty specific type of kid that is going to want that academic program. So now you've got that combined with trying to find kids who can play basketball on top of that. So especially sort of being your first foray into recruiting, what did you learn about the recruiting process and just thinking about how that has impacted you now as, as you moved on to Carnegie Mellon? Well, I, I had a great trial by fire. Uh, the head coach that hired me up there, David Muchnick, um, he, he, he was great. And, and you know, the, the recruiting aspect, boy, I learned a lot fast. You know, I still remember the nights he'd be in his office, I'd be in mine, and he's listening to my phone calls, and then I'd hear, you know, hey, Sloan. And I'm like, oh, boy, what'd I say, <laughs> right? You know, and just just kind of getting used to how, how to make the calls, right? And Because I'd never done it. And so, you know, he was awesome, kind of that, that trial by fire. Hey, figure it out, right? We're going to talk about it, but but you got to go do it, and you got to do it in your way. Um, and, and so, you know, we for being that small school in the middle of Maine, um, we recruited almost exclusively out of state. And so we were pulling kids from uh, Virginia, Florida, Texas, California, um, New Jersey. Um, so in my two and a half years, you know, we got guys from six different states um, in my time. And it was awesome because, you know, I really kind of got that taste of, of national recruiting. Um, I, I got a you know, and for me and, and kind of the history of that program, you know, there, there wasn't a lot of tradition. There, there wasn't a lot of history. And, um, you know, Coach Muchnick was that was his first you know head coaching job. And and so we we got the opportunity going out of state to, to really be able to to tell our own story. Right. We, we weren't battling as much of the preconceived notions and reputation. And, um, you know, we could we, we could tell our story and, and, you know, we could present the program the way we, the, with our vision. And, and that was awesome. It, it was just a lot of fun, a lot of learning, got told no a lot. Uh, but, you know, at a school like that, um, I, I found very quickly, it's, you know, cast a wide net and, and try and, you know, try and get the no as soon as you can. Um, because if you don't hear no, that means you're closer to yes. And, and so really pushing, you know, pushing guys on, here's who we are, here's, here's what we're doing, here's the way the program's going to go. Um, do you want it or not? And, and if you don't want it, that's great, we're moving on, right? But, but if you do, you know, and, and once you got there, um, we yielded pretty well, actually, on, on visits. Once they got a chance to see campus, uh, you know, see what the academics provide and, and see the opportunity from a basketball standpoint. From your perspective, as – an assistant coach, I think a lot of the guys we've talked to, Dave, one of the things that's most interesting is that a lot of guys who come in and they're maybe the only assistant on a staff. And so they'll tell us about how they just kind of got, as you said, thrown to the fire and you're getting to do a million different things and thinking about how that benefits you in your career as you move forward because you just get to have your hand in a lot of stuff. When you think back to those two years, what are a couple of things that you got to do that you feel like have really value have really benefited you now as you've moved on to Carnegie Mellon. 
Well, I, I'll start by saying, you know, they, they there's really two ways you can go kind of getting into coaching, right? You either jump onto a staff that's, you know, bigger school, successful, whatever the case might be, and, and you kind of work your way up from the bottom where you're not really doing a lot. Um, or you go to a really small school and you have to do everything under the sun, right? right? And and yep. mine was the latter. Um, I, I got there. Actually, you know, I got hired as, as a basketball coach and I got there and realized that they also needed an athletic trainer. And so they created a part-time position for me. So I worked as an AT in the fall and spring, um, coached in the winter, recruited in the summer. Uh, I, I mean, it was, I got the full D3 uh, environment, you know, and, and it was, I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. And, and a lot of people ask me that about, you know, we, we didn't have a lot of success. I, I worked for two guys, um, it, you know, two guys in my two and a half years there, um, both of which were, it, it was their first head coaching job um, in a program where we didn't have a lot of tradition. We didn't have a lot of success. You know, the, the records weren't there. And, and people often ask me like, hey, you know, what, what do you think? And I'm like, I, I would not trade that for anything. I got to do so much. I, I had to figure out social media. I taught myself Photoshop. I had to do all of our recruiting. Um, I, I, you know, had a, a big hand in, in, the, in the schemes. I ran our player development. Um, I did class checks and ran our study hall. I, you know, uh, I, I, heck, up there, they also didn't have admissions counselors. So they would send me on the road to do college fairs at different areas of the country. And then I'd be able to recruit kind of in my downtime on those trips. And I, I figured out a way to recruit nationally without having a big budget. And, you know, there, there just were so many aspects that I, I don't think people get when they're you know, a, a fourth assistant or, you know, a, a, a guy who, hey, you're, you're going to do one job, right? Um, I, I just got to experience everything. And, and I, it was a lot <laughs> to kind of figure out <laughs> in, in a short amount of time. I, I, I can imagine if you ask uh, both of the guys I, I worked for up there, they, they probably said some bad words about me uh, <clears throat> every now and then. And as I was kind of figuring it out, but um, but there's no doubt that that experience is what led me to be confident that I could step into a, a school in the UAA directly from that, which is not a jump that a lot of guys are able to make um, and, and be able to have success and, and, you know, do a job well. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Let me ask you, before we jump to Carnegie Mellon and how that opportunity came to you, how did you handle the losing part of it? Because I think that's something that, look, everybody – likes to win and obviously it's more fun for players, coaches, everybody when you're winning. But there also comes a time where most guys at some point in their career have to lose. And as a coach, you have to be able to handle that. And then not only that, but you have to help your players to be able to handle that losing and continue to be able to compete and do all the things that are necessary to hopefully turn it around so you can eventually start winning. So how did you handle the losing and what did you learn about that process of being able to figure out, hey, this is kind of where we're at. We got to deal with it and we got to keep pushing forward. Just talk a little bit about those experiences there. Well, I think the, the first thing that I, uh, I learned about it, I'm not sure I was prepared for it, right? I mean, any, co any competitor going into a situation, you think you're going to win every game you play and, right. and then you get upset. You know, coaches were greedy. So you get upset every time it doesn't happen. Um, but I... I to me, I, I really learned very early on how you need it, how you needed to to tie everything into the vision of the program, and you know, a place like that, which was you know really trying to build a program, um, and, and again, two first time head head coaches, um, I learned very quickly. Hey, we got to stay on vision, right? Where are we going, and and how is everything that we're going through going to help us down the road? And players don't often see that. I didn't often see that, at, you know, it, it, at the time. But really focusing on, hey, we, you know, we lost this game. What can we take from it, right? What steps did we take forward? Can we find the positive in that to keep a, you know, to keep working, to keep our head down, to keep progressing? Because we're gonna get to where we want to get to. We just don't know how long it'll take, right? And and so being disciplined to to stay you know a little bit of that tunnel vision right of of finding the positive finding the the constructive areas um maintaining that that unified voice of of vision and where the program is going to go but then 
a lot of it is also talking to players about, hey, this is how it's going to help you, right? Um, our style of play, this is how you fit. You know, hey, you didn't, you, you scored, but we didn't win. So what does that mean, right? How, how can you help us win more rather than just score more? Or, you know, whatever, whatever the stat might be. And, and so it was a lot of communication. Um, definitely something I've learned more kind of looking back on, I think, uh, of looking at conversations maybe I didn't handle well or situations that I should have done more um, a, a, as, you know, the assistant coach or, or, you know, if I would have been there now with the experience I have, here's what I would have done. Um, but it, it's a lot of communication. It's, it's a lot of just, can we find a way to, to find the, the small victories and keep moving? Um, cause the worst thing you can do is, is stop moving forward because you're never in neutral, right? You're either moving forward or you're moving backwards. And, and so finding ways to, we, we just got to, we got to plow through, right? We got to take the, the wins we get, whatever those wins look like, we got to build, one brick at a time. We got to take one step at a time, and and we're going to get to where we want to get to if we if we remain committed. Yeah, I love that idea of small victories, right? Because sometimes you can't always control what goes on on the scoreboard when it comes to your one loss record. Sometimes it just is what it is, and you can keep working, and you may not see that result. But what you can do is you can find small victories every single day, whether that's statistical victories, whether that's effort, effort victories, whether that's culture, what, whatever it is, you can find those small wins every single day. And if you can reward yourself and reward your players, your team through that, then you can kind of keep them moving towards what eventually you hope will turn that one loss record around. Your first impression is everything when applying for a new coaching job. A professional coaching portfolio is the tool that highlights your coaching achievements and philosophies, and most of all, helps separate you and your abilities from the other applicants. The Coaching Portfolio Guide is an instructional membership-based website that helps you develop a personalized portfolio. Each section of the Portfolio Guide provides detailed instructions on how to organize your portfolio in a professional manner. The guide also provides sample documents for each section of your portfolio that you can copy, modify, and add to your personal portfolio. As a Hoopheads Pod listener, you can get your coaching portfolio guide for just $25. Visit coachingportfolioguide.com slash Hoopheads to learn more. And let's be honest here. We're talking about basketball, right? We're talking about a sport. Like, you got to have fun. And, and, you know, losing is not always fun. So you've got to find ways to make the time in between those games fun, Right. How, how can we have fun in practice? How can we have fun on campus? How can we have fun as a group? Um, you know, Dan McNeely, who came in, he was he was the second head coach I, I worked for. He came in in year two, and man, we started doing some some team building stuff, and and you know, it, it just it was a lot of fun, right? And and one of the first things that goes when the record doesn't go your way is morale, and the minute that happens, that that hill becomes steeper and steeper. Right. And, and so finding ways to break up the monotony, finding ways to have some fun with the guys, get them laughing, um, you know, just just find ways where they can be reminded that, like, hey, we're playing a sport. We're at a good school. We're getting a good education. We're going to get a good job. Right. Let's have some fun in these four years. And I think the, the more you can find that fun factor, you know, the easier going that that journey takes. And I'm going to go back to something you said earlier about being intentional, right? That's something that you have to be intentional about because Absolutely. it's really easy when you're losing to not have things go that way where everybody gets grouchy and the team morale goes down and boom, suddenly not only are you losing, but the fun, whatever fun that can be had is also taken away. So I think that idea of being intentional about, hey, we got to come in and we got to keep morale up and we got to look for ways to have fun and we got to look for, as you said a few minutes ago, those small victories. And that's how you kind of keep guys going and keep the morale up. To me, that makes a ton of sense. I just wish I was a little better at making sure I remember that all the time. It's hard. <laughs> man. It, trust me, I get it, man. It is, that is, that's easy to say <laughs> yeah. and hard to do. Easy to say, hard to do. Talk a little bit about how the opportunity at Carnegie Mellon comes your way. Obviously, as you said, you're making a leap from a program that is fairly obscure to a school that has an outstanding national reputation 
from an academic standpoint, you guys are part of one of the best Division three leagues in the entire country. So how do you get that opportunity? Well, a lot of people, you know, told me as I got into coaching and and always say, you, you got to get really lucky. And, and I have been pretty fortunate to get pretty darn lucky. Um, and, and so actually the, the way the position, it was the, the position came open late. Um, it, it was in August, you know, kind of tail end of August um, that, that it was open. And um, I, I heard about it even a little bit later. I, I really wasn't looking. Um, and, and, you know, I got called from, from, a, uh, somebody in my network who, who had a connection and, you know, they said, Hey, uh, did you apply? And I'm like, Oh no, I didn't even know it was open. And they, you know, Hey, apply tonight and I'll, I'll reach out. Well, I was actually on the road in New York city as an athletic trainer with our main maritime football team. And so my, I was lucky enough. I didn't even have my computer. Uh, my, my head AT <laughs> at Maine Maritime, same age as me, came in with me. We, we're best friends to this day. You know, I'm like, hey, man, I got to borrow your computer. I, I got to get my resume. Like, I, I got to put this together in the hotel room. And, and so I'm in New York City. I'm, I'm putting this together. I, I apply and, um, you know, I don't hear back. Well, by this point, it's the end of September. And I don't hear back. Um, I, I finally hear back and, and uh Tony Wingen, who's the head coach at Carnegie Mellon, he's been there 33 years now. You know, he responds, hey, we're bringing some people to campus, um, I, I, you know, this weekend. I, I'll let you know if anything changes. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm out, right? So I tell uh, Coach McNeely, my head coach up there, hey, not, not a, a thing. I come to work on Monday morning and I get a text, hey, you need to call Tony now. And I was like, oh, no, what just happened? <laughs> so here I get it. Uh, I get an email and, and Coach Wingen says, you know, hey, uh, position still open. Are, are you interested in, in interviewing? And this was the first week of October. And so I on Monday, I had my first conversation with him. I, I flew down on Wednesday to interview. Um, it goes until the, the Thursday practice starts. October 15th is a Monday. The Thursday before practice starts, um, I, I, you know, had gotten the position, but I was waiting on paperwork and my AD and up, up in Maine, you know, came to me and said, Hey man, we're a state school. Like you're going to be there on Monday. Like I, I'm not, I'm not making you put it two weeks in. You're going to be there. I, I need you to move forward here. So I resigned on a Thursday, signed my paperwork Friday, moved out of my apartment in Maine, uh, Saturday. And I showed up to, uh, coach Wingen's office Monday morning at 8 a.m., uh, without a place to live on the first day of practice. And he said, you got three days. I uh, put me in a hotel and, and he said, hey, you got three days, find a place to live and uh, show up for practice. And so it uh, it was a whirlwind going from, in, in a matter of about two weeks, going from being in Maine another year and, and you know, the final touches really preparation before that season to I'm in a new place with a team I don't know. And um, and I was told we cha- we were changing the way we played on both ends of the floor. So I didn't even have film to go off of. It was like, <laughs> hey, man, show up for practice and, and let's, uh, let's get to work. Talk about trying to figure it out, right? You're figuring it out <laughs> on the fly, man. But, and, and I laughed. We had a part-time assistant, Kyle Goldcamp, who had been here for a couple years. And, you know, Kyle's 6'10", uh, played in the G League, played Division Two. you know, and, and I – I joke with him to this day. I, I just followed him around like a puppy dog, man. Every time I wanted to yell, because coach told me, he said, I hired you to coach. I didn't hire you to stand here. So he's like, I want you yelling. I want you talking to the guys. I want you to, well, I, I don't know what he likes. I don't know. You know, I, I'm exactly. trying to figure exactly. all this out. So I just followed <laughs> Kyle around. And every time I, I went to say something, I just kind of look up at him and I say, hey, Kyle, what's he think on this? And he's like, no, you're, you're good. So then I'd yell and I'd talk to the guys or Hey, no, don't say that. I'd be like, thanks. And that it kind of went that way for about the, the first half of the season as, as I was kind of feeling out the guys in our in our program and, and coach winging and just kind of figuring out what to do. It was uh it was fun. Man, that is an experience to be able to come in with that short of notice and really not have any real knowledge. How much did you know about the program and the school and I'm assuming that at some point, as you started looking at the job, you started looking at the roster and maybe trying to learn a little bit about what they were all about. But how much did you know going in? I, I didn't know a whole lot. Um, you know, I, I, I there was a, a player uh, from my high school who was a uh, few years ahead of me um, who actually played it at Carnegie Mellon. Um, so I knew of the school from him um, and he was a hell of a player. So I knew that they were good. Um, but I, I didn't really know a lot about the UAA or, or the program 
Um, I was lucky. My my cousin, um, he got both the athletic ability and the brains of the family. Um, he actually was a high jumper on the track team at Carnegie Mellon. And so, you know, it was kind of cool to, to get back to CMU and, and spend two years with him as an athlete um, here. And, and so he helped me out a little bit trying to figure out, you know, the school and, and all of that. And, you know, I, I, I'll tell you that the situation could have gone pretty poorly, you know, in terms of my relationship with the players pretty fast if if the guys weren't as, as amazing as they were. And, you know, I came in and again, I mean, I, I don't know them. I didn't recruit any of them. I, I'd never talked to them, you know, that kind of thing other than on my interview. And, and I came and now in. You're and, now you're yelling at them. Yeah. And, and those, I mean, they were, they were awesome. They wanted it. They wanted to be coached. They, you know, they're laughing with me. They're making fun of me probably more often than I would have liked. Um, but, <laughs> but I mean, it, it was just, a, it was a really good group. And, and I learned really quickly that like, Hey, if these are the kind of kids we're going to get, man, I'm gonna have a lot of fun here. Right. Because it, it was for, for them to accept somebody that late in the game and, and start and, and a diff, you know, somebody they had no connection with or whatever, and, and being open to coaching and being open to game planning and, and all of my ideas and the way I operated, and all, which was different. And for them to take that, I, I was like, all right, I, I like this spot, right? I, I like these guys. I'm going to have a lot of fun here. Um, you know, Coach Wingen is awesome. And, and, you know, to be able to kind of have the green light right away, um, that was something I didn't expect. So, you know, I, I appreciated that and kind of helped the the process a little bit uh, of kind of getting comfortable. But, man, the, the players just made that transition way easier than what I had in my head for the week and a half before I got there. <laughs> so as that season evolved – what did your role look like from a, an in practice standpoint? Just what were some of the responsibilities that you kind of took on that first year? Because obviously, I'm sure Tony had some ideas of, hey, this assistant that I'm going to hire, this is what I want this guy or need this guy to be able to do. And then now, when you put an actual human being in that position, and you kind of got to figure it out. So, so what were your, some of your responsibilities that first season? Yeah, so the the biggest one was um, being in charge of all game planning, um, all all scouting. Um, you know, I I, I kind of did the the video work, and then we'd talk as a staff and kind of you know fine tune what the game plan was going to be. Um, but I I jumping in, I, I had a lot of new teams to learn pretty darn fast uh, to try and get those together. Um, and then you know again, he he just kind of like. It, it, there wasn't a whole lot of divvying up, if you will. I mean, it was, hey, you're, I, I'm hiring a coach. I, I don't, I don't want a statue, right? Like, I'm not, I'm not bringing in somebody to stand there and look pretty. Like, I'm, I'm bringing in somebody that I want in practice, getting guys better in the gym, you know, doing all of that. And so, um, I was lucky enough to to have a voice from the beginning in terms of ideas and and um, you know, not a ton of necessarily running drills, but kind of as the year went on, that that grew. Um, as I got a better feel for, you know, what we wanted to do and, and kind of what matched up philosophy-wise. And um, and then obviously with our recruiting, you know, it's it's a different time frame from, a, a, from most schools, right? I mean, we recruit for November 1st. Um, can't get anybody in after January 3rd. And so, you know, I was in, in a position, we actually had a recruit on campus my first week uh, on the J. It was my third day on the job. We had a, a recruit there, and I had to take him from one part of campus to the other. Um, needless to say, I, I was pretty happy he had already been there, and I kind of followed him. <laughs> um, you guys and, both had your maps out. Yeah, and, 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 hey, he he committed, so I, I I don't know. I must not have messed nice, it up you did too much. Right. Um, but you know, it just kind kind of came in at a time where our class was almost done. Um, I, I you know really didn't. There there were a couple guys I talked to to kind of shore up the class, but really it was hey, you have a little bit of time. You know, the, the next class is going to be your class as the recruiting coordinator, you know, figure it out. And, and so I got lucky that I, I did have a little bit of window that, that I could kind of figure out the school, figure out the program, figure out where we got guys. You know, I, I had a little bit. It wasn't like I had to dive in and all of a sudden I got to yield three or four kids in a month. Right. I, I had a little bit of, of getting used to that before I started in that next class. How important was that first off season in terms of sort of catching your breath and getting caught up and, and really diving into what you needed to be to make the program the best it could be. I got to imagine that that was a pretty important spring summer for you after that first season. 
Man, I'll tell you, my, my friend, we get to like April. My friends are like, oh, man, where's your favorite place in Pittsburgh? And I'm like, dude, I haven't been outside of my apartment. Like, <laughs> my, I, my, I, apart, I my, apart, my apartment in the gym, right? I was like, I don't even know how to get to my apartment yet. Like, I, I was just in such <laughs> cruise control because, you know, everybody laughs about that. You know, the fall is kind of like, especially when you get a new job, right? The fall is like I'm getting used to the place. Then we dive into the full-fledged season, and then I kind of wind down. Like, for me, I, I didn't have any buildup. Like I went zero to a hundred, right? I showed up and we are in season. And so that, that spring was personally, like I got to take a breath and I was like, okay, <laughs> right? Let's, let's relax a little bit. Let's, let's think about things. Let's, let's look back on the season, but really gave me a good opportunity to step back um, and kind of fully evaluate. And, and had, now I had some film. I had six months of, you know, seven months of coaching to know philosophy more and um, start to get a, a sense from the guys of like, what do we look for in recruiting, right? Where do we go? What do we do? Um, and, and, you know, now I, I was lucky enough that, you know, coming in as the recruiting coordinator and having some national recruiting experience, um, you know, Coach Wiggins was like, hey, where, where are we going? Like he asked me, he's like, where, where are we going to get guys? And I kind of paused for a second. I was like, aren't, aren't you supposed to tell me? Like, what? you know, I, I thought this was, uh, I, I was hoping for a little lead here. But, uh, you know, we, we sat down, we talked, you know, here's where guys from the roster are from. But he was like, hey, where do you want to go? Right? Like, where do you have connections? Where do you think we can get guys? Um, and, and let's go after it. And so he gave me a massive voice um, from the minute I got to campus, which, uh, again, I, I can't say I came in expecting, but um, ha- has been one of the biggest blessings for me just again that kind of trial by fire right of of being able to to go through the experience rather than just kind of coasting like hey i'm i'm making mistakes i'm making decisions i'm i'm having to figure things out and so that that first off season was was big i mean it was it was fun getting to to recruit you know we we had a sl- we have a slightly bigger budget uh, than i was used to and so <laughs> getting to go to more places getting to be all over the country you know from a personal standpoint i had a blast and, and, you know, from a professional standpoint, just being able to finally kind of kick back and say, all right, guys, what do we need? Now I, I know what the UAA is like. What kind of players do, do I need to go get? Um, where do we got to get better? Where do I need to get better? You know, it, it was a good kind of reflection time once I got that whirlwind of a first year through. All right. So you mentioned that from a recruiting standpoint that you guys are targeting November 1. Yep. And obviously most people know that Carnegie Mellon – the academics there are second to none across the country. So just tell people a little bit about the process and how it's maybe different from an average Division three school and sort of what you guys have to do to go through that recruiting process. Yeah, so for, for us, the, the first thing that I had to get used to is it's just an earlier process, right? We're, we're starting on, you know, we're, we're starting junior year on guys. Um, and, and, you know, we, I mean, we're asking them to commit before they ever play a senior season. Right. right. And, and yep. it's just, it's different. It's, it's not something I was used to. Um, I, you know, still there, there are a lot of people that don't, that don't think about that timeline. Right. Because it's, it's just, there's a, there's a few schools that do it. There's not a ton. Um, and so, you know, being earlier, being, being earlier to the game, you know, I laugh sometimes. I, I feel like I catch myself looking at transcripts before film and I'm like, man, I never thought I'd be doing this. But, you know, really having to evaluate, do you have the right classes, right? Do you have the grades? Um, do you fit what, what you know, we are looking for in each of our major areas? Because um, we're different. You know, we have six undergrad colleges that you apply to. It's not the umbrella of Carnegie Mellon. And so, you know, each college has a slightly different uh, admission standard based on what that college is, right? Our psychology majors and our computer science majors are different. And so they, they want different things. And so getting used to all of that and, and being, you know, trying, now, still not great at it, but I feel like I'm getting better at kind of that first look of evaluating, hey, do you fit here or here? Uh, and then the other thing that, that's different for us, we do a lot more with camps and less with AAU tournaments. And reason being, it just yields better for us. We can be more efficient. You know, camps where like Ivy League, Patriot League, elite camps, um, you know, going to academic specific camps, um, it helps us because we have the academic information, right? I, I can't tell you how many times I go to an AAU tournament. I'm like, man, that kid's really good. Can't get in. <laughs> that kid's really good. Can't get in. Like it, it just, it, it's not a good use of our time. And so those tournaments, we're going to watch kids that we know. We're, we're not really finding a ton. 
um, the camps are where we end up doing more of our kind of finding um, just because we have the academic information readily available. All right. So once you have the academic piece in place and you're sitting at one of these elite camps for an Ivy League school or Patriot League school, what is it that you're looking for specifically from a player standpoint? Obviously, there's a requisite amount of talent that a player has to be able to have to play at that level. But what are some of maybe the intangible things that you're looking for that are important to you and your program? Well, I wish I could say recruiting was more science than art, um, but it definitely isn't. Uh, there's there's a sliding scale for just about everything, right? And, and kind of, you know, what do you need that year? Um, how do you envision yourself playing? Do you, dif- do you need a different style of player, right? Like, do you have a lot of guards that can score, but not playmake or, or, Hey, we've got bigs that are good on offense, but not defense, right? Whatever that is, that really shapes what, you know, what we look for from a specific standpoint, but kind of uh, overall for us, um, the biggest thing skill wise that we look for is you got to know what you do really well and you got to do it. Like too many guys, too many guys are like, well, you know, I'm a good shooter, but I'm going to, I'm going to try and, you know, get some assists and we're going to try and battle some seven footers inside and get, like, <laughs> like why? Right? Like I, I, I talk to our guys all the time with this analogy and they, they probably roll their eyes every time I do it. But like every time you see these guys get drafted, right? NFL draft is going on tonight. So it's making me think about it. But every time you see a guy get drafted from, from, you know, college to the pros, right? Outside of like the top, what, two picks? What does everybody do? They pick one thing, they get really darn good at it, and they make a lot of money, right? Like those three yep. and D guys. I mean, they're, they're making like 20 mil a year to stand in a corner and shoot threes. Like it's, it's wild to me, right? But now look at every high school kid that goes high school to college. Everyone wants to be LeBron James. Well, I got to add this to my game. I got to add this to my game. I got to add, like why? Why is it so different going from high school to college than college to pro, right? To me, it's the same idea. So Yes, we're going to add to your game. We're, we're, we're going to help you, you know, in that development piece. Like, you got to become a more complete player. But, like, you got to know what you do really well. And you got to be aware enough and confident enough to stick to it. Now. That's a great point. That, I love that. Th- that development, right? So, so let's, let's take a shoot. I was a shooter. I never went inside the paint. I, I, got, my, I got my shot blocked <laughs> at my first pickup game in college. And I was like, no more twos for me. I'm staying out here. So, um, you know, for, for shooting, like, how do we grow your game? Well, we're going to grow in terms of coming off screens, screening reads, shooting on the move, right? Different areas. Um, you know, we're, we're going to work on uh, m- maybe even getting to the point that we can add off the bounce shots, right? Well, that's growing your game, but it's staying in your lane, right? It's staying in your specialty, in your strength. We talk about playing to strength all the time. Um, and, and so for me, when, when, we, when I'm out recruiting, like I, I should be able to find out the type of player you want to be within about five minutes of watching you. Now, it doesn't mean you got to hit 10 threes or get 10 assists or whatever it is, but like I should see what you're seeking in those five minutes. If you're a shooter, you better be you better be working. You better be fighting for your feet. You better be fighting for shot attempts. You better be running the floor, finding spacing, right? Whether you get a shot or not, that, that doesn't matter. But in those five minutes, I should know. And if you're confident and aware enough to do that, you're my kind of guy. You're our kind of guy. Because that's that's what makes our offense good, is guys that understand what they do. We talk all the time, versatility doesn't come from having 15 guys that can do everything. It comes from having 15 guys that do what they do really well. And so for, for us in recruiting, we look for that first. You gotta have a skill set, you gotta know your strength and have a skill set that can impact our program from day one. And then we look at what else can you do, right? What what you know, hey, you're a shooter. Can you get in the paint and make a pass? Right? Can you defend? Can you rebound out outside your area? What whatever that case might be. So that's what we look for from a, a skill perspective, but for us, as, as we're recruiting, you know, really, we, we call it the ABCs, right? We're looking for academics. We're looking for basketball. We're looking for cultural fit. And the guys that we have, the guys that want to be a Tartan, the guys that want to be a Carnegie Mellon, the, the guys that we want fit those three areas. If you don't fit those three areas, you're, you're not our kind of guy. Because uh, <laughs> the thing I found out very quick is Carnegie Mellon is a challenge that's not for everybody. Cause it's freaking hard, man. <laughs> Playing in the UAA, <laughs> doing the academics, the travel, like it, it's it's hard. And, yep. and I'm sure all the high academic schools could talk about that, right? It's it's hard. And so you gotta want that challenge. And the only way to want that challenge is if you fit in all those areas. 
it's really interesting, David, to have this conversation because it's something that I never really thought about. And we talked to Mike Procopio, who used to work for the Mavericks, and he does a lot of work with player development. And, uh, and he talked a little bit about how just what you said, that you got guys, 3 and D guys that are staying in the corner and they make $20 million a year to do one thing. And his point that he made to me was, look, how many guys in the league get to do everything, get to do what they want? <laughs> and maybe every every team maybe has one that do it to different yep. degrees of success. I mean, obviously you start with Well, somebody's got to take the most shots and, and average the right. most points, right? Absolutely. So even on a bad team. That. Right. Even on a bad team, there's still somebody who kind of gets to stir the proverbial drink. But those guys still probably if they were on a better team, probably wouldn't have that same role. So he was like, there's, there's maybe – 15 guys who just have carte blanche to do whatever they want. Everybody else is a role player and our job is to try to maximize whatever is, whatever it is that they do well so they can help their team win. I, I think and, you also you, you also can tell a lot about somebody's like th- their them as a person about their willingness to do that. Right. Yeah. If if they are if they are self-aware enough and confident in themselves enough to say, "Hey, on this team, this is what I got to do and we're going to win." Right? Then, then you know exactly what they're what they're after, what they value, and what they want. And yeah. and you're going to be successful if you surround yourself with a bunch of guys like that. If you're, and they're smart enough to figure it out, right? Yeah. And and too many times, especially you know for for male athletes, and I think that's part of it coming out of high school. Like it, it's the ego, right? It's like, hey, if I'm a college athlete, like I, I need to be the big man on campus, right? And and a lot of their kind of personality and identity is is tied to that. But if, if you got a kid that's confident enough to know, hey, I know I'm good, right? But this is this is how I can be good for us, and, and this is what you need me to do, and this is what will impact winning. Holy hell, you're going to win a lot of games, man. You you are going to win a lot if, if, you, if you've got guys that buy into that. And here's the other thing that I think is super interesting that goes along with it is, yeah, guys got to figure it out. First of all, you got to be smart enough to recognize – what is my role? And sometimes even the player can look and be like, hey, we got guys that can do X, Y, and Z. Maybe I need to lean more into yep. doing this because that's my road to playing time. And I think too often players don't see that. But you made a point earlier about how come players going from high school to college don't see it, but guys going from college to the pros see it. And I think what's interesting is that it's almost like the way we think of player development, it's almost flipped in a sense that when we're working with somebody who's in – second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, elementary school kid, what are we working on? The whole entire package, right? Like we want that kid to be able to be a better shooter. We want to be able to be a better passer. We want everybody to be able to handle the ball regardless of how big they are. Everybody's multi-positional and doing all these things. And so if you watch a workout that a trainer is doing with a kid who's 12, that's probably going to be touching on like everything versus when you get to the college level or even when you get to the pro level, especially – Guys are working on, hey, this is what I do. Like, I've got to be able to make this corner three when I'm wide open. I got to be able to stick this thing. And I'm just working on that over and over again. Or I'm working on, I got to screen and get here. I've got to be able to switch and guard. I'm a big, I got to be able to guard guards. And there's just so many little things that you have to do. And it's so interesting because intuitively, you would almost think it would be the opposite, right? That, hey, the pros, those guys can do everything and they can, they want to work and be this all court player. And the kids would be like, hey, just play this role and do that. But we've almost flipped it. And I think that because kids grow up in the game trying to learn how to do everything and try to excel at everything, that that's where when you get to college, and again, probably if you're a college basketball player, you're one of the better players on your high school team and so on and so forth. So those kids are used to kind of doing a little bit more. Now you get to college and all of a sudden it's like, no, you, you're not just going to, we're not just going to give you the ball and get out of the way yep. and let you do whatever you want. You got to fill this role. And it's just, it's interesting when you look at sort of from the beginning of when a kid picks up a ball to whatever the, you know, whatever the end of their career looks like that it sort of flips that at the beginning they're working on everything. And at the end, they're just, most of us, most of us are just role players. Well, I think because there, there is a foundational level of every school that you got to be at, right? For like sure. If, if you can't take two dribbles, yep. it doesn't matter how good you are. Like you're, you're not going to progress, right? And so there, there is a foundational, you know, uh, skill level or threshold you've got to meet for every level that you move up. But it, it is, it's like, hey, can we, can we, you know, 
everybody just, and it's probably because everybody just grows up watching and who do they think of? They're not talking about Steven Adams, right? They're talking about LeBron James. And and so they're they're idolizing the, the, the main players, the guys that do everything, and that's what they see, right? And and so I think to me, it's it's just trying to find ways to celebrate and, and really value every role. How do you impact yeah. us? We recognize it. Your teammates recognize it. This is what we need. The more they feel valued, the more willing they are to do it. It's just so interesting to me, again, because I think as players, when you talk to players, not very many of them recognize that. Because, again, everybody wants to grow in their game, right? Everybody wants their role to be bigger. Everyone wants to continue to get better. And that's something that's a positive. It's a huge positive. You want kids who want to get better and improve, right? It's like, yeah, it's like excel in your role, but continue to prepare for the next one so you can grow it and you get that and yet at the same time i think there's sometimes there's an unwillingness to accept what that role Mm -hmm. looks like like hey you could get out on the floor if you're gonna do x and y at a really high level and so it's just interesting how you know it's just interesting how it works that Kids, kids have to figure it out. Well, and part of that is is our jobs as coaches, right? And, and you know, I I probably haven't done a good enough job, you know, in in certain situations of of getting of of explaining that, right? Of you know, here's your value, here's what you can do, here's how we see it, and, and here's here's why that fits fits you, right? And and building that value, building that confidence. Um, that's part of our jobs as coaches is, you know, we've, we've got to present it and we've got to teach that and, and get it, you know, have it be understood to the point of understanding value. And, and if we, if we can't get there, then it's partially on us because we haven't done our jobs. Once you get a kid on campus and you get them in your program and you're getting them to buy into your role, into their role, and you're, you're trying to build a cohesive team, what does that look like in terms of culture building for you guys? How do you put it together? I know you said that year one, just the high quality of the human beings mm-hmm. that you're dealing with as players gives you guys a leg up, I'm sure. But just talk a little about what you guys do to build culture. Well, I, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm lucky. Co- Coach Wiggins been here 33 years and and that man is unbelievable. At, at, I mean, and, and I, I say that because I got to campus at my first alumni weekend uh, we had 50 guys fly back from literally all over the world. We had a guy fly back from Australia, and he came back every year for it, right? And so, you know, I, as an outsider, I saw that and immediately saw the impact and in, in what Coach has been able to do in his time in terms of building that culture. And it really, it, you know, going into year two for me, kind of in my first, you know, real kind of full recruiting class, um, you know, we we kind of added some things to to the recruiting visits you know, we start our visits with a, a player, uh, two of our players meet with the parents and the recruit with no coaches. We, we start every visit that way. And, you know, it's it's really because our players have kind of taken the keys to that culture piece and they know who they want in the program. Um, they know who fits. They, they know, you know, from a person standpoint um, and, and we value that. And so, you know, there's there have been kids o- over my time here that, you know, they're, they're great players and, and we get done with the overnight visit and, you know, our guys are like, coach, he doesn't fit. And we're like, all right, he's not coming. Right. And, and so valuing that and, and our players taking that lead, I think has gone a, 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 that to me is, is the only way you're going to continue building culture, right? Like coaches can do so much. There's all these team building and, and conversations and whatever, but when the players take the keys, boy, you're in a good spot. Right, because it means they care. It means that they're gonna they're gonna guard that, um, and that's really important. But you know, we do a lot. We give our players a lot of a voice. Uh, just about every decision we make, you know, we consult our our captains and and our or our leadership council. Um, you know, so while they're on campus, they're they understand that it's about their experience, and we make sure that they have a say in that. Um, again, at least there, you know, the leadership from, from each year's program has a say in what we do in that year. Um, we talk to them about a lot of things, um, you know, in heck in practice, we'll, we'll game plan and we'll be like, all right, guys, how we guard this? Like you, you tell me, <laughs> right? Be, because at the end of the day, like if they don't, if they don't buy into whatever you tell them, it's not going to happen. And so, you know, really making sure that they know that they're empowered. Um, it's a two-way communication street, like 
Like I, I tell them all the time, I, I want them to tell me when my scout is awful. Like if I miss, like they better tell me. And <laughs> I think sometimes they look at me like, are, are you sure? And I'm like, well, I hope I'm not wrong often. But <laughs> if I am, like you, you got to tell me. And I, and I think the, the more you can do that, then I think the better, um, the more empowered they feel, the, the more comfortable they feel. And they understand their value in the program. Obviously, at the school, they, they know with all the stuff that they do academically, internships, you know, extracurriculars, like it's it, these dudes are just amazing. Like it, it's it's incredible what they do. But when they know from a basketball you know standpoint as well that um, we're here, you know, we, we talk a lot about basketball as a part of the career development and educational experience. Right. So like we make decisions in that manner. So incorporating all of that, I think the guys understand, you know, what our main goals are. And again, Coach Wingen's done an unbelievable job in his time of kind of setting that standard. Um, but now the guys, they, they take in and run, man, and it's, it's fun to watch. As you're building that culture, and I, I know one of the things that is super important at the Division three level is having those player leaders – because the off season, I know you guys are getting your eight days, which everybody's excited about to be able to work with players. <laughs> I'm sure you're trying to figure out well, what are we, how are we going to maximize those yep. those eight days. But still, the off season because you guys don't get the same access that the other levels might to your players. That building up those leaders, not only in the season but in the off season, is really important. So, what are the steps that maybe you guys take, or just how do you provide space for your guys to be able to? develop leadership. I think you kind of touched on it a little bit is sort of getting their input, yep. but just, is there anything else that you guys do specifically to sort of develop the leaders on your team? Well, it, it goes, you have to be intentional. Like I, I, leadership doesn't just happen. Like, yeah, you need experience. They, they need, you know, need to have their space to, to be able to kind of grow, you know, work through things and, and mess up if you will, or, or whatever the case might be. But um, I, I think our job as coaches is we've got to be intentional in like setting guys up. So finding, you know, underclassmen that, that we see as kind of those emerging leaders and, and having the conversations early. Like we tell every guy that comes into our program, we are like from day one, you're here for a reason, you have a voice, use it. Like you, 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 don't, need to, you don't need to earn equity. You know what I mean? Like you're, <laughs> you're in, we recruited you, the guys checked off on you, right? Because they were part of the visit. Like everybody wants you here, you've automatically got equity to use your voice. Now, how you use your voice that depends on how much leadership grows, right? And so getting guys to understand the need to speak, the need to, to seek out those opportunities, but never feeling like it's a, a hierarchical, you know, well, okay, as a freshman, I'm not there. As a sophomore, maybe I think about it. Like, we, you, you got to get rid of that. And so, you know, we, we, we just talk to our guys a lot. And that's, you know, formal conversations, informal at practice, you know, see them across campus, whatever the case might be, like they need to understand what being a leader means. And, um, you know, talking to guys about like, hey, your, your, you know, here's how your actions can be viewed. Not saying they are viewed that way, but here's what can happen to kind of chip into that leadership that, that you're building, right? Or, or here's what you can do to help build that equity in, in leadership. And, um, and, and so being intentional, having conversations, making sure that, you know, they understand that like all these guys, you know, that that's where we're lucky. You know, I, I, I love being at schools like where I tell people all the time, I don't have to sell. I just give facts. Like our school is good enough, right? That, that I tell you the facts, you tell me if you like it or not. And, and <laughs> right. so our guys know that they're going to be CEOs. They're, they're going to do, you know, it, be inventors. They're, they're going to do incredible things. And so they understand the need. They're mature enough to understand the need to be a leader, but they just need kind of pushed along that path. And so, you know, hey, here's what you did in practice, right? If you want to be a leader, this can't happen. Or, hey, I, I saw you, you took control of this. You know, we, on Saturday, we host the special, the, the Western PA Special Olympics. We host the regional Special Olympics. We've got a couple guys that run different sports in that Special Olympics. And that's not something we've talked about, right? The guys just kind of, that's just what we do in the program. The players just kind of pass it on. Um, but now it's talking like some of our younger guys, uh, you know, they jumped in and they're leading a sport that we've never led before, right? And so talking to them about like, hey, this is what that initiative does. This is what you can learn from it, right? So it's not, yeah, it's volunteering and, and it's an awesome opportunity, but let's make sure we're learning from it too. Right. And, and understand how that correlates to leadership. And I think the more intentional you can be in kind of making sure they see every experience and, and opportunity, um, then the more likely they are to grow into those those leaders that you want them to be. 
That's well said. I mean, the intentionality piece of it, I think we can go back to just about any part of being a coach and the more intentional you can be about what you're doing, the better off you're going to end up being. We're headed towards an hour and a half. I want to ask you one final two-part question, David. Part one is when you look ahead over the next year or two, what do you see as being your biggest challenge? And then part two, when you think about what you get to do every single day, what brings you the most joy? So your biggest challenge and then your biggest joy. Well, I think my, my biggest joy is I'm coaching basketball. Like, you know, there's, there's a lot of other things that a lot of people are doing. And, and, and I, I've been lucky enough, you know, I've had the support, you know, family wise to be able to kind of per, pursue this and um, especially at the D3 level, which is where I want to be. And um, I'm lucky, man. And, and, and that's, that's awesome to me. Right. Every day I go into work, like it's, it's funny. I, I talk to people going into nine to fives and office jobs and all, and I'm like, man, I'm, I'm going to the office. I'm a watching basketball. Like, Oh, it's professional development. Right. You know, like I'm going to turn yep. on the NBA game from, from the other night. I, you know, <laughs> it just, it's fun. And, and I, and I think you know, you, you've got to find that fun, but the other thing, and, and this goes all the way back to like why I want to coach in college. Like I, I hope, um, that I'm able to to be part of an impactful four years, right? And and they may not realize it <laughs> then, right? It, it might take a couple years, might, but but my hope and and where I get great joy. But again, I, I hope that our players and the people you know in our department and in our program kind of see it too. Is is that we can have a lot of fun, we we can win some games, we can be in the best league in you know in D three. Um, and, and we can have the fun doing it. Right. And, and it can be an impactful, it can be a learning opportunity that, that to me is, is I, I just have a blast with it. Now the, the challenge is right. And I think every coach will say this is, is find a ways to win more. Right. And, and really, you know, finding the, the opportunities to not lose any of the other pieces that we talk about, the, the career development, the, the academic experience, the networking, the, you know, college growth and experience, you know, all of that. How can we do a better job of providing that same experience while also finding ways to win more games? You know, we, we had our best season this year in 15 years. Um, we we were right on the cusp of, of being able to, you know, kind of down the stretch, competing for UA title, competing for an NCAA bid for the first time in 15 years. And, you know, we've seen it. We didn't do a great job this year uh, of handling that. You know, we didn't prepare them. I, I don't think as as well as we needed to to kind of handle that that stress and, and pressure. But you know, we we've, we've seen it. Now, can we keep building, right? So, without sacrificing anything, can we can we keep adding to to the experience we offer, um, to to the opportunities these guys have? That you know, in twenty years, man, they're going to look back like I, I was a part of. I was a part of three conference championships, and the only year I didn't win the conference championship. We won the ECAC championship um, in my four-year career as a player. Like, I got four banners hanging, and, and that's all I remember, right? And, and I, it's an awesome thing to look back on. Our challenge is, can we get back to hanging banners? We've been there. We got to get back to it. And, and trying to find a way to do that without sacrificing everything else, um, you know, we, we have our methods. We're confident we're going to get there, but try, <laughs> trying to get that, you know, sooner rather than later, right? And, and how can we do that each year and keep building? Um, I mean, I, I think that's every, every coach's goal, but I, I think it is, I mean, it's a challenge the higher you get, right? The better you are, the harder it is to keep move, taking those steps forward. Absolutely. I don't think there's any question that anybody who's out there in the coaching profession, you're always trying to strive for that next that next step up the ladder, right? What, whatever it is, right? Yep. You know, because every is, right. program's at a different spot. And so what, what what is your next step? You know, yep. let's let's get there. Let's get there sooner rather than later. And, and, <laughs> and let's, you know, keep building from there. So if you have any magic answers, I, I'd appreciate all the help uh, that I, I could <laughs> I get as we, as we try and figure it out. I wish. I probably should go back through every episode. Maybe I could unlock <laughs> it over the course of 700 or whatever episodes we've done. So... All right, before we wrap up, David, I want to give you a chance to share how people can get in touch with you, find out more about the program at Carnegie Mellon. So, you want to share social media, website, whatever you feel comfortable with. And then after you do that, I will jump back in and wrap things up. 
Perfect. Well, really appreciate uh, you having me on. Best best way to get, uh, you know, learn more about our program. Um, if you go to our athletics site, it's athletics.cmu.edu. You can get to our, our team page. Um, from there, obviously, all my contact information is there. Um, or, or go to my Twitter at coach underscore D S L O A N. Um, and from there, you can link to all of our team social media pages and, and all of that too. Awesome. David, cannot thank you enough for taking the time out of your schedule tonight to join us. Truly appreciate that. And to everyone out there, thanks for listening. And we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Hoop Heads podcast presented by Head Start Basketball.